to talk about the taming of the tongue um, and just the importance of building each other up. And so I was thinking back on my long life here, my 19 years on earth, and I'm sure some of you have more experience than me, but I was thinking back on the experiences I've had with maybe me tearing people down or building people up or um, watching people do the same. And I've seen how incredible the tongue is and how powerful it is that it can be used for two extremes. Um, it can be used, for example, for um, 
breaking someone's insecurities. Some insecurities they might have, your words could easily help um, break it down, um, lessen it. Sometimes you can even take away insecurities. At the same time, your words, even the things that you don't really mean, can make insecurities, can make people insecure, can take the insecurities people already have and enhance them. You can make someone cry. You can make someone really sad. You can ruin their day. Again, a lot of it, people say, oh, it's their decision. But at the same time, you could have easily made them laugh, make them smile. Um, you could easily make their day and totally change someone's day around if they were having a bad day just by saying a few words. Um, so I think that our tongue is extremely important. And so today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about it. Um, in James 3, 7 to 9, it says, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. So I've had the privilege of getting to travel with my family and um, recently we came back from California and one of the coolest things we did there was go out there and we did whale and dolphin watching. So you go out on this boat, we're all with the family, he gives us the rules, don't jump off the boat and swim with them and stuff. So um, we, they didn't want Jonah part two. And so we're watching and you look at this, the dolphins were great but the whale was what really got me because it was huge. And I thought, like, why are we going to watch these whales? Like, they just do, like, woo, and that's it. And then the dolphins jump and do all this stuff. But the coolest part about the whales is you got to see how huge they are. So the whale goes into the water, and there's this, like, ripple effect um, that is different from the waves. And you can see how big the whale really is. And then I thought back to, like, SeaWorld and different things like that when they had, like, the killer whales and... Um, I like to call him Shamu, that's how I grew up with him named us. They would tame Shamu, and they would get it to do anything they want. It would flip in the water, do tricks, it would um, carry them, give them a piggyback ride, and like shoot them in the air, and do flips, and throw water everywhere in any direction they wanted. And I thought how crazy it is that this, this whale is huge. It's so big. And they, they're able to just make it do whatever they want just by whistling, moving their hand like this. And same with lions and circuses and stuff. And so the Bible's saying you can tame these beasts, but you can't tame your tongue. And your tongue is this tiny muscle in your mouth, and you can't tame it. You can tame anything else, all these wild animals. You can tame them as much as you want, but you can't tame your tongue. James 3, 2 says, Indeed, we all make mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in any other way. The Bible is saying if you could control your tongue, we could be perfect. That's how big the tongue is. It's small, but it has the biggest impact ever. And the Lord is saying if you could tame your tongue, you could be perfect. You could control everything else, but we can't. And then... Um, you can also like use your tongue to speak life into people. You can speak life into their giftedness, the talents, the gifts that God had given them. You can um, compliment them. You can tell them, wow, like that's awesome the way you're using it. And you can really speak life into people's giftedness. You can speak life into your relationships. You can encourage one another. You can really build relationships with your tongue. You can do so much with it, but there's two extremes. Which one are you going to use it for? No man can tame the tongue, we've established that. So it requires a supernatural intervention. Proverbs 4.24 says, Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. It's saying avoid it. Don't even go there. Don't even go near it. Psalms 141.3 says, Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. It takes more than you. We can't do it ourselves. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to ask God to help you. This isn't built into our sinful nature. We have to ask the Lord to help us control it, to give us a supernatural power to control this thing that even man can't tame. What do you, why do you think God gave us our tongue? To praise him, right? Why did he give us a mind, 
our thoughts? Why do you give us our heart to guard it and use it to glorify him? Why did he give us every aspect of our being to praise him? But what are we using it for? We're forgetting why God gives us all everything that we have and we're using it for, for evil. When we could easily be using it to bring so much life into the world and so much life into each other. Don't take people for granted. Lift each other up. Build each other up. To take for granted means to assume that you'll never lose it, which is not true. So treat everyone like you could lose them. Build each other up. Love on each other. A lot of people like to joke around like they hate each other, which is great. But don't forget to love each other in the end. So what are you doing with your doors of life? Are you using them to speak life into people? They're your doors of life. Use them for what the Lord has given you them for. Just thoughts for the day. So I just want to share something God just put on my heart to share. Um, a friend of mine from college, acquaintance, like I knew her a little bit, sent me a message last week on Facebook. Um, and she said, hey, Jane, I'm interested in learning more about Christianity. Would you be free to talk about your faith? I was like, wow, like, I literally did nothing. <laughs> she just sent me a message and wanted to talk. Um, and it hit me that, like, God is the one who initiates in the hearts of man the desire to know him. And um, we got, we um, hung out at Whole Foods, and we talked. And um, it's amazing that she's so interested in hearing about Jesus. And it reminded me um, just how awesome Jesus is. And when I was sharing about why Jesus is the answer to her, it reminded me that Jesus is the answer um, to everything. And so when we sang that song with everything, I don't, God just reminded me that like, our life goal is to give him glory and to honor him, and we need to remember that. And sometimes he, in his um, awesome sovereignty, pulls that together in our lives. And I think the more we seek him, the more we'll find him. And um, as we sing this next song, it says, you provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice. And it's like the same thing. Like God plants the seeds and um, we have to help sow them. And um, ultimately he makes it grow. And so let's just worship God with this song and ask him to fill us up. You provide the fire And I'll provide the sacrifice You provide the spirit And I will open up inside
Good morning. I missed you all, and I have to say that uh, I um, I missed uh, in a high at a high level of magnitude my dear brother Alex because he has been traveling for a good while, and I've been traveling and we haven't seen each other. So I want to thank the Lord for each and every one of you, and also Alex, and the same with Andy Brown. Uh, I think we both have been out for a little while. And uh, you, have, you all have a very special place in my heart. Um, last week I went with my family on a vacation, <clears throat> and it has been almost seven years we haven't gone as a family on a vacation together. So it was very special, and especially um, having Jacqueline and Sammy's family with us was, was indeed a very special time. During that time, the Lord spoke to me from this passage, and I will share it with you as to what the Lord has, uh, has talked to my heart uh, from. Uh, I'm reading from Revelations 2, uh, 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So, beloved, the Lord talked to my heart during this time period of maybe rest and vacation that go back to your first love. And often we ask the question, what is first love? It says in scriptures in Matthew chapter 24 that because of the increase in wickedness during the end times, chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness during the last days, the love of most people, including believers, will grow cold. But he who perseveres till the end shall be saved. That is, will be saved from that cold love, from that state of lukewarmness. And it is true that during these times, with all the hate that we see around us and all the wickedness, all the killing and all the pe way people each, treat each other with so much cruelty, that our love towards the Lord and towards each other will grow cold. And we are at the freezing point. The spiritual temperature on the outside is so cold that it's freezing cold, and that you can easily get that frostbite that the scriptures is talking about. But the big question, what is, what is the first love? What is you have forsaken your first love? Your first love is the peak of your love to the Lord. When your love was not only emotions, but it was willingness to do his will. It was willingness to live for him. It is the first love, is the first love of the church, the body of Christ, the believers. And here it's only prudent to talk a little bit about this church. The letter is the church from the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation to that church called the Ephesian church or the church at Ephesus. So what is that history of that city and the church? Now, Ephesus is in Asia Minor, where Turkey is now. And it used to be one of the most affluent and the largest cities, if you may, uh, in, in the whole empire, the Roman Empire, in the whole world. It was a place like possibly New York, like you can say today in the world, or maybe in the United States. It was a big affluent city that had almost half a million people. Now, half a million during that times is like having a city now with 50 million. It used to be a huge place. 
and a also very affluent place. But this church was visited by Paul, and during his first visit, he sort of made some contacts with Aquila and Priscilla in that place, and they started a house church, and then it grew. And during his second missionary journey, they started that church. And the, to understand the first love of that church, you have to go back to the book of Acts and see the declaration of Paul of the first love in action. It says in the book of Acts, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 17, from Melitus, Paul sent, was sent to Ephesus for elders of the church. He sent for the elders of the church. And then he made, in verse 24, a great declaration of defining what first love is. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me, my only ex until I fulfill my aim to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus Christ has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. In other words, that first love is that utmost love. The Lord Jesus Christ lived and died for me, and I will live and die for him. He, has, he is the first and he is the last. He is the kind of a center of gravity in my life, and I will live to honor him, even if I'm willing to die, I'm willing to die for his name's sake. It is well defined, the first love, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, it says. He's speaking to his people. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. That is of your, it says, it's used during the, the, I remember the devotion of your engagement. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. It sort of reminds us of the true first love when people fall in love during the first, uh, the first early kind of a uh, uh, days of their either married life or maybe during the, during the time of engagement, and when the person is just thinking about the other person all the time, and that person is the kind of center of their life. I remember when I was engaged to Lamia, my dear wife, and it was during the war in Lebanon. I used to be, it was last year of uh, me doing my, it was actually first year internship, of first year of my residency. And I remember I used, to, I used to work in the emergency room, and it was war in Lebanon. And so one day after I finish during my rotation, it was 36 hours of rotation, at 7 p.m., I used to go and visit her. Her house was not very far from the hospital. And my, I had an uncle, Uncle Theo, who didn't have children and was like his, his, his only child. He loved me passionately, but he was always so worried about me. I was young, and he thought that I, you know, I would just move, walk in the streets of Beirut during the night, and it's very dangerous. You can easily get shot at because there is war going on. So I remember that night, on Tuesday night, I was out of duty at 7 p.m., so tired, and I was out leaving the emergency room, and I see my Uncle Theo waiting for me. I said, he said, hi. He said, I'm waiting for you, and I just want to escort you back home. I said, no, I'm not going home. I'm going to see my fiancé. He said, are you crazy? Can't you hear the voice of the, the guns? I mean, they were shooting in the streets, and there were, there were some fights right next to her house. He said, no, but I gave her my promise that I will go and visit her. He said, are you crazy out of your mind? He wasn't married, and he hasn't been through what I was going through. He said, are you out of your mind? You lost your mind? You want to walk all the way to her house? You want to die? I said, yes. I gave a promise that I will see her, and I'm going to go there, Uncle Theo. He said, I'll go work with you. I said, no, no, you don't have to come with me. <laughs> I'm just, so I mean, just want to give you an idea. And to me, the, all the kind of sounds of you know, machine guns and all the shelling that was going on meant nothing to me. I had to go and meet my first love. Now, I want to tell you this, that you know, this is what happens when we come to the Lord or when we make a commitment to the Lord. We come to the peak of our sort of a first love, but then things would wax with time. That love would grow old. It's said of a couple that they were going after during their honeymoon, going from one city to the other in the train, and, you know, every people would notice that they're, you know, newly wed. And so they would ask them, they would ask the kind of uh, newly wed wife, 
the bride, you know, how, you know, when were you married? And all, they would ask them, and she, she told the husband now, the, she told the bridegroom, she told him, look, I'm sick and tired. Everybody keeps asking me. Let's pretend that we have been married for a long time. He said, yes. The only way we can pretend that is when we go down from the train during the next stop that you will carry the bags, the luggage, <laughs> rather than I will do it. And they did it, and nobody asked them. You see, during your first love, you're willing to do whatever the other person would ask you, whatever would, you will carry the loads of the other person. And this is the relationship that should be maintained between us and the Lord. Now, it's well defined, it's, it's kind of when, when you say the word Christian in this world, it means nothing. Francis Schaeffer, the great writer, and man of God, who's uh, <clears throat> mentioned that when you say the word Christian, it's, it's contentless. What does it mean to say Christian in this country? You know, all what you're saying is possibly that the person is not a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist. You're not saying anything. But in the, although the world has difficulty defining what is Christian because of the, all the propensity of pseudo-Christians, the Bible has a well-defined and the Lord Jesus Christ defined very well what it means to be a Christian. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Christian is defined as a man controlled and captured. His heart is captured and mind and soul is captured by the love of Christ. This is what it defines to be a Christian. And on a daily basis, you have to work on your first love. And here is that we're kind of we, we find the definition in scriptures in Matthew 27, 37, and 38. The G Jesus replied, he said to the man, love the Lord. If you want to be really be a person, the man of, uh, after God's own heart, if you want a true, true, true believer, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then love your neighbor like yourself. You see, the whole issue of being a Christian is to be a man or a woman of love. You love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and you're willing to love people around them. You want to love him and make his love known. And Matthew 10, 37, 38 he defines it again the Lord. He says anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. This is definition of first love. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take the, up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now you say kind of, a, you've set a high standard. Well, the Lord did. And I want to quote what, what Dad said, that this is not written in your old nature. I love that kind of, a, a kind of that verse. It's not written in your old nature. You cannot do it by your own willpower. To love the Lord with this mighty love, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit and controlled on a daily basis by the Holy Spirit. And renew that first love. To love the Lord and that kind of great love is to build a strong relationship with the Lord. So let's go to that kind of church. The church started with a great love. But then it started going downhill. And here he commends them. You see, he gives us a good illustration of when you talk to a brother or or when a sister talks to a sister, you know, when we're upset with somebody, we see everything negative in them. But the beautiful thing about the Lord is that he starts by commending them for the good things. He says, hey, you have 60% of good things, and I want to tell you what they are. He starts with the commendation, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. He says, you cannot tolerate wicked people. They're false people. And false prophets, you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. If he talks to the church, he says, look, I, I know who you are. You persevered despite hard times. You continue to love each other. You want to honor my word. He says, I know all of these things. But I have on you this one thing that you have forsaken, your first love. And this is where he goes into the concern. The concern is that you have forsaken your first love. And then he gives them a command. He says, repent. Go back to that first. See where you have fallen. You see, you were at the peak in your relationship. And now see where you have fallen. You have fallen from your first love. Go back to that relationship. Go back to that commitment. 
enter that love relationship with the Lord. And then he counsels them. He says, if you do this, to the one who is victorious, if you don't do this, I will take your lampstand. Now, what does lampstand mean? He said, you let him take his lampstand. Take my lampstand. What does it mean? My, your witness. The lampstand means your light. I, you will lose your witness. People will look at you and see a pseudo-Christian and say, what kind of a believer is this person? You will be mocked by people. But I, if you remain victorious, he says, he gives them a counsel. If you remain victorious, I'll give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I love the book of Revelation. Because it's full of true symbolism, great symbolism. He says, listen, if you really persevere and victorious, I will give you the gift of fulfillment of salvation because eating from the tree of life is salvation, but also it means satisfaction. You will be satisfied with me. You will be happy. It's like, blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You'll be filled. You will not want. You feel that I am your satisfaction and your fulfillment and the fulfillment of your dreams. Now, how can we maintain our first love? I have her seven minutes, seven and a half minutes, so I'm going to give each one of them two and a half minutes. The first three things. One is how you can maintain your first love is to determine on a daily basis to do his will. You cannot love him and maintain his love without doing his will. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. It says in Matthew 12, 50. In John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love him, will love them and show them myself. Dear children, it says, 1 John 3.18, Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Look, love is not emotions. Love is action. It's love in action. It's doing his will. And on a daily basis, when you wake up, you want to say, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to live a life that follows your first steps. I want to live a holy and pure life. I want to live a life that would honor you and your commands. I want you to live through me today. Empty me, O oh Lord, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to do your will. What is your will? And I want to do it. And your will is for the lost to be saved. Lord, show me somebody who's lost so that I can love on them and I can bring them to your will, which is their salvation. Your will for me is my holiness. I want to live a holy life. Your will for me is to kind of a, be a person after your own heart and obey your commandments. I want to follow your footsteps. I want to do what Jesus can do and will do. It says of the, about Eric Wenheimer, the blind person who conquered Mount Everest, the first blind person to get to the, to the top of Mount Everest in 2001. And when he got there, and they all clapped for him and said, what is the secret? Somebody asked him, and said, it's very simple. He said, I was tied to my coach, and he was climbing, and I would follow him. I was tied to him with a rope. And that reminded me that we are tied with the greatest bond of perfection, which is love to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we truly love him, Although we are blind and we don't see where we're walking, if we just follow him, we'll reach to the top, the top of our love experience with him and in spiritual life. The second thing is love his word. You cannot love the Lord without being close to his word and be in fellowship with him through prayer and the word. Make it a daily habit that you go to the word, read the passage, have a little devotion with the Lord, Spend time with the Lord. Give it your priority. It says that seven days without God makes one week. But one week is W-E-A-K rather than W-E-E-K. So we spend seven days without God. We come from Sunday to Sunday to worship and learn a few things about the Lord. And we are weak. We have what they call as anorexia nervosa. You know, have you heard of anorexia nervosa? Now, we have some med students here. Anorexia nervosa is a state where it, usually a woman which sort of tries, tries to lose weight because in her mind, 
she sees herself to be very big and very heavy. And she stops, her hunger center sort of shuts down. And that person would stop eating and becomes emaciated to the extent that she would be like the, the people you find them in the you found them in these concentration camps. So emaciated and so thin. But then when you ask her, why don't you eat and draw your image of yourself, she would draw an image of a fat person. And this is what happens to us. We think that we are big spiritually. But reality, if we examine ourselves according to the truth, we are so thin and emaciated and so weak. We think we don't need God and we don't need his word. It says, not by, every, not by bread shall man, man shall live, but every word that cometh from the mouth of God. You need it. It's your daily bread. You need to read the word. You need to have your own devotion and have the Lord speak to you from his word. Or else you're going to miss. Love his word. And the last thing is love his worthy children. A reason why I said his worthy children is because they are worthy of his love because of Christ. And they are therefore worthy of your love and your service. If Christ loved them and died for them and served them, then you should do the same. It's not because they are worthy of you. They're worthy of God's love because of the blood of Christ. They've been cleansed by the blood. Love his worthy children. Love on one another. What that sort of reminded us this morning of how we should treat each other, brothers and sisters. It says beautifully in scriptures, it says, New command in John 13, 34, 35. New command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you so much you love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And here it's forgiving love. Here it's compassionate love. Here it's caring love. Here it's outreaching love. Here it's serving love. Here it's sacrificial love. It's not emotional love. Emotion is just the icing over the cake. And love one another. The Lord has raised a small group of young people in this place. You have the potential. You have the potential to change the city of Houston. Because you have in you the greatest power in the whole earth. If you do it the way the Lord wants it, through love. You see, look at the other people who are dedicated to other gods. When they fall in love with their God who is God of hate, they go and kill others. Look around the world. But you have chosen the true God, living God, who is the God of love. And you can transform the world. By your love, indiscriminate and unprejudiced, true love. And everyone who believes that Jesus Christ, it says First John 5, 1 and 2, Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. You cannot love the Father without loving the child. This is what it says in scripture. And the Lord commands you to love one another. And depend, as you love the Lord, have this love over, go to overflowing, as we did sing with the last hymnal. Let it overflow to the lost and to the people around you. Have a plan of outreach. And I will stand with you on this. Let's reach out to the young people. Let's reach out to people of our age to the kind of a, uh, the teenagers we have here, even to the children we've had to. Let's have a plan of outreach to just love him and make his love known. It's a beautiful story that I've, I've heard and read one day that two people were walking in the desert. The older sort of a, the older friend, on the way they had a quarrel and they quarreled and the older one who was leading the show, slammed the younger one on the face. But then after they walked for a while and they were without water, they are almost going to die, when ultimately the older one, the friend, the big, sort of big brother, when he found there was water, 
he sort of uh, moved the younger one. He carried him on his shoulder and moved him to the place where there was a little oasis and made him drink first to make sure he revives him. And then when they rested down there, that younger friend started writing something on the sand. And then he wrote something on the stone. He carved it on the stone. And he told him, what are you doing? He said, what are you writing on the sand? And what are you carving on the stone? He said, on the sand, I wrote that you slammed my face. But on the stone, I have carved that you saved my life. He said, why did you do it this way? He said, because there is a lot of wind here, and on the sand it will just be carried away. It will be wiped out that you slammed my face. But on the stone I carved it so that it will never be forgotten that you have saved my life. And this is the way we should treat one another, forgetting what is bad and loving each other and such remembering the good things about each other and fight the good fight of faith, shoulder to shoulder and back to back. I want to tell you the story that is a real story that Napoleon, when he went into, into Russia, went in with a half million people. He was defeated because of the cold. That cold winter of Russia destroyed the great army of Napoleon the same way a century later it would destroy, more than a century later, the army of Hitler, the Nazi army. And on their way back, they were left with only 20,000 men. Most of them are injured. Now, the historian who writes the story writes it very well. He says, on their way out of Russia, when they got to the Baltic states, they were getting frozen. Soldiers would get frozen because of the cold. It's minus 40 degrees, and they're walking in that kind of cold. And as they were frozen, he said, the wolves would come and attack the soldier. And the soldier is so much frozen that he's not able to use his gun. And he would be eaten by the wolf. There would be coming, there would be days that would be coming to this world when the temperature, like now, would be so cold that you will not be able to use your spiritual weapons if you are going to be in that cold state, that frozen state. Keep your love on fire for the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for all what you have taught us. Lord, we teach us how to love you. Lord, keep our love warm and keep it on fire for you. Let us love you so that we can do your will. Let us love you because we love your word, because your word is like fire and keeps us warm. And it's also bread that keeps us satisfied and filled. And let us love to do your will. And this is the will, your will for us, that we remain holy and dedicated and committed and set apart for your holy use. But also let us love one another in order to keep our love fresh, to love you by loving one another and loving the lost and caring for one another. Lord, cleanse our hearts one more time and return us to that first utmost love in your precious name, fill us with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, so the beautiful voice that you hear every day that falls from heaven in the choir uh, will not be with us uh, next week. He is heading towards Virginia. Um, so yeah, so he, he's going to be, uh, if, you have, if he owes you money, anything that you need to talk to him about, today's the day you want to talk to him for. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, what we want to do is, is pray for him. I'm a little biased because he's my brother. So we're going to bring him up here. Um, and Brother John and Brother Imad, if you want to come up too, we can um, um, pray for his, uh, his journey in Virginia. And I got a blessing there. Okay, before we pray, we have an announcement. Uh, men's Bible study will be Thursdays, <laughs> 7 p.m. So that soft voice is going to be an aggressive voice in the future. We'll have to... John. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, that even as we say goodbye, we say see you again soon. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity you've opened up for Sammy. Grant him, Lord, that he will speak your word, that he will shine with your love wherever he goes. Give him your protection. Give him your strength. Give him the joy from us that comes with him. And, Lord, bring him back to us 
so we can have another Dr. Rad here soon. Mm -hmm. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for this wonderful young man, and thank you for the witness that he is for you. I ask and I pray for all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> so the whole men's Bible study, that's true. Um, so I'm be going to Virginia, but we're still doing men's Bible study over Google Hangout. Um, but if you want to meet at the church, Ted will be coming to the church on Thursdays um, at 7 p.m. so that we could still meet up that way. But we'll be over, it'll be over Google Hangout, so I'll be you know, still trying to get with you guys that way. So let's, uh, let's continue to do that with the men. Um, and uh, God bless, and hope you guys have a good week. Thank you.